Uh, so welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to another edition of the colloquium. Thanks for joining us at this uh, unusual time. So I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today, uh, Professor Imke de Pater. Uh, now Imke is currently, what's the full title? It's the distinguished emeritus professor at UC Berkeley. But she actually started her career in the Netherlands and I believe she got a PhD from Leiden University. And her career focus has always been uh, uh, observations of the large planets and, and, and the solar system. And one thing probably all of you remember very well was when comet Schumacher-Levi hit Jupiter in 94, and there were a lot of observations of that event. So I believe Imke led that effort back in the day. And so I believe her, she's going to give us a colloquium about more uh, large planets. Uh, since this is a colloquium, I'm going to ask for questions in chat. And then afterwards, I will give people a chance to, to ask questions and to raise hands. But for now, basically, Imke, it's over to you. Okay, thank you, Oleg. That's, uh... Okay, so the Voyager spacecraft gave us a first glimpse of how interesting uh, Uranus and Neptune are. A very dynamic Neptune, but Uranus was initially seen as quite boring. But later processing uh, using much newer processing techniques uh, showed that actually also Neptune had several small cloud features, in particular also near the polar regions. Uh, and those were determined, as I'll show you later, to determine its winds near the South Pole. So note that Uranus' pole is in the ecliptic plane. So the South Pole was facing the Sun and Voyager and us at the time that the Voyager spacecraft flew by, and the rings were seen almost face on. So, but why are Uranus and Neptune interesting? So with the discovery of exoplanets, interest in these planets grow, has grown even more, in particular related to the question, how and where do they form uh, within their protoplanetary disk? So a key ingredient for these models is composition. So we refer to Uranus and Neptune as the ice giants, uh, and that's in contrast to the gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn, since Uranus and Neptune are composed mostly of what we call fluid ices, in particular water, in contrast to the gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn, which are much closer to a solar-like composition. So as part of our solar system's formation theory or history, we also need to understand the formation of rings and moons in orbit about these planets. Now, I won't really tell you the solution of how these planets formed, but I will uh, address a a, a few key uh, uh, things over there. So I will start with showing some early post-Voyager images and results. And I will talk a little bit about the ring systems, although that is a bit orthogonal to the main focus of the talk. Uh, the, the main focus really is composition because it's tied in with formation theories and atmospheric circulation. And for these, we do need wind profiles and the temperature and orthopara uh, hydrogen maps. So I will conclude then with the long-term evolution of planets. So in the 1990s, when Hubble Space Telescope came online and the viewing aspect of Uranus actually had changed, uh, we saw small cloud features on Uranus appearing here at the, I don't know if you can see the pointer, but uh, appearing at the north limb that just came into view after being in winter uh, shadow for about 40 years. So on Neptune, to everybody's surprise, the great dark spot had disappeared. So a few new dark spots were discovered. Uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, that is in 1994 and 1996. After then an absence of dark spots over the next 20 years, two more were discovered uh, in 2015 and 18. And in particular, the one in 2018 is 
quite long lived. I mean, it was seen, still seen in January of 2020, as shown here, and it even had some transient dark spots, which, I mean, we don't know really what they are. Uh, but uh, we don't know if they're still visible now. We just got some more data or will get some more data this coming weekend. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if that spot is still present, yes or no. So these dark spots can only be seen at blue wavelengths, so around 450 nanometers. So the Hubble Space Telescope is actually critical here. So when adaptive optics on large telescopes became a reality, we could get extremely sharp images. So this is what Uranus and Neptune, or, or Uranus looks like uh, at 2.2 and 1.6 micron uh, without adaptive optics. And if we turn that system on, uh, then you can see the small features just show up, just an incredible amount of, um, of detail. So the difference between these images, 2.2 micron, you look really in the methane absorption band uh, and, and hydrogen absorption too. Uh, but because of that, the light that is reflected from Uranus at 2.2 micron is, um, is just not very much. I mean, it's absorbed in the atmosphere, whereas at 1.6 micron, the methane absorption band is less deep. Uh, and so you uh, actually, the planet shows up much brighter and you can hardly see the rings around it. So it, I blew it up a little bit. So you don't even see the rings on this image. And here we have Neptune indeed with adaptive optics uh, using two different uh, wavelengths bands and just a color composite here. So before continuing the main talk, uh, I'll show a few slides of the ring systems because I think they're neat and, and to show what we can do uh, using these ground-based telescopes. So when Voyager flew by, it showed for Uranus that Uranus had these very narrow rings like strings on a guitar. Uh, also a few, so a few moonlets I've seen and they kind of confine uh, the, at least the outermost ring. For the innermost rings, we still don't know what confines those rings. So when looking, uh, the forage had from past and look back at the sun, we see light in forward scattered light. And the second image shows uh, that in that case, we see a lot of dust in between these narrow ringlets. Uh, and um, that's uh, quite intriguing as well. So with Keck, we have monitored these rings while the rings were closing up. Uh, basically, the viewing aspect changed here between 2001 and 2007, when the rings were uh, completely edge-on uh, to us. And actually, when they are edge-on, you start to see rings outside the main ring system. So here we have the main ring system, and then you very faintly can see some more rings outside which are the so-called mu and uh, new rings. So those rings are intriguing because they look a lot like Saturn's uh, G and, and, uh, and E rings. And for Saturn, uh, we, we know that the small, that the E ring is blue, uh, consists of just only tiny particles, one micron in size or smaller. And that's caused by Enceladus uh, the geysers on Enceladus, which, which spew out a lot of um, small water ice particles. So for Uranus rings, uh, which look very different, also an outermost blue ring, which again means that basically we see a Rayleigh scattering, just like uh, why our atmosphere is blue. Uh, but we don't, well, there is a moon embedded in that ring system, a moon map, but it's only about 10 kilometers across, as opposed to Enceladus, which is about 500 kilometers. Uh, so we cannot envision that that little moonlet would be active uh, with geysers. This inner moon, ring that I showed, the red ring, that is actually a normal color for dusty rings around planets. So map. Maybe that it's just meteorite sputtering that uh, sort of uh, releases a lot of uh, dusty particles. 
small particles, but then you have to have something that is uh, scooping up the, the larger material. And so that's still a puzzle. And we hope that this uh, new Uranus orbiter and probe that NASA uh, is planning in, well, I think in two, 2050, it might get there, that that may actually give us the answers. Not sure if, if I will see that or not, but anyway. Uh, our view of Neptune was also completely changed when Voyager spacecraft uh, encountered the planet. So we have the iconic image of Neptune with its great dark spot, and there's a second dark spot and, and a little bright feature named Scooter. Uh, but Voyager also discovered several rings around Neptune, uh, and most remarkable were the ring arcs, Fraternité, Egalité, Liberté, and Courage. Courage is the leading one. Um, so those were sort of predicted based upon some occultation experiments from the ground, but uh, people still, of course, were quite amazed when they actually saw that there were ring arcs and that they continued to persist. In addition to the rings, the Voyager uh, discovered six small moonlets uh, increasing in size from Nyad, which is 60 kilometers uh, closest to the planet, to Proteus, about 400 kilometers across, farthest away. So all these rings actually were named after people who discovered Neptune and its largest moon, Triton. So that very small uh, moon, Hippocamp, uh, was discovered only a few years ago in Hubble Space Telescope data. So it orbits very close to Proteus, which is the outermost and largest one, again. And that is shown in that little HST movie. So Hippocamp itself is circled in, in red, and next to it, you can see Proteus. So Proteus has migrated outwards because of tidal interactions with Neptune. And our results suggest that Hippocamp is probably an ancient fragment of Proteus. And that provides for further support for the hypothesis that the inner Neptune system has been shaped by numerous impacts. So this scenario is actually supported by Voyager images that show a very large impact crater on Proteus, almost large enough to have completely shattered that moon. So we observed the ring several times with the Keck telescope, uh, and we noticed that the two leading arcs were slowly fading away. Now, in order to build up sufficient signal to noise in such images, we had to add many images together, uh, and that is uh, shown over here. Um, uh, and because you just then integrate essentially over much longer periods, you can see that the moons, which of course orbit uh, Uranus, uh, where are seen in little arcs. I mean, they trace out little arcs whenever you have the exposure. And similarly, we expect that for the ring arcs because they orbit Uranus as well. So in order to find out the structure of the ring arcs, we had to deproject each, sim uh, each uh, individual image uh, and then stack the deprojected images uh, together and in that way, you can actually find the ring arcs themselves. So this is in 2003 and in 2009. And when you make scans through these images, you first for the Voyager data in 1989, you can clearly see all these ring arcs in the Voyager data. But then in the Keck data in 2003 and red and uh, 2009 uh, in uh, whatever, blue, uh, black, uh, you can see in 2009, there's just nothing uh, leading the two trailing arcs. And that was later on also um, uh, confirmed by HST images. Okay, we'll go back now to the planets themselves, Uranus and Neptune, and that is what the rest of the talk will be about. So over the years, we have uh, observed Uranus with HST and Keck and uh, this, this row of images from 1997 to 2007 clearly shows the changing viewing aspect of the planet itself. And in addition, you can see that sometimes you see features, uh, cloud features show up, 
in particular this, this big one, but also this polar haze over time has slowly increased in, um, uh, in, in density. But most remarkable really were tiny little cloud features at Uranus North Pole that we discovered. Uh, and these cloud features, when you uh, look at their basically uh, motion on Uranus, uh, they all showed, regardless of their precise latitude, they showed a westward drift rate of about four meters per second, and that is shown in this wind profile. So as if they are fixed to a solid body. Uh, so that's um, something that we had never seen before. It's very different from the wind profile in the south, which clearly shows a much more normal wind profile. Uh, so we don't know if this will change in the future when we get an observing aspect that is more like what we observed on the other pole with the Voyager spacecraft. So that still has to be determined later. So in 2017, uh, my graduate student at Malta uh, developed, together with the Keck observing uh, assistants, uh, developed software for our so-called Twilight Zone project. And that's a project that we envisioned where observing assistants could use twilight time just before the sun would rise. Uh, and that's time during which the sky is usually too bright for most astronomers. But it's ideal for snapshot observations of these very bright solar system objects. So during that first test run uh, in June 2017, uh, he captured this massive storm system on Neptune, a storm that is about three quarters the size of the Earth. So it was getting also much brighter in the following week. So the storm is actually near Neptune's equator where we usually don't see much activity at all. So it's quite intriguing. Uh, so this storm was also imaged regularly by the amateur community. And that gave us a wealth of information. Here's just one image from Phil Miles. Uh, and it was observed with HST. And using HST and CAC together, we could, uh, using radiative transfer calculations, show that the top of this storm had to be around the half bar level, which is just, just below the tropopause. So this storm was tracked over a period of seven months. It was still visible at the end of July, but it had disappeared in September. And instead we see a string of cloud features along the equator. Then it was back in October and remained visible until at least the end of December. So using all these data, we could actually determine a wind speed for this storm system. Uh, and I'll get back to that in a minute. But going back to this um, kind of string of cloud features at the equator, that really reminded us of the uh, storm system on Saturn in 2010, 2011, uh, where a storm just appeared and an entire string of clouds enveloped the entire circumference of the planet. So on Saturn, such storms have been seen every about 30 years. So, so really pretty rare. It's thought, thought to be driven by episodic Morse convection. That is that the convection is suppressed for decades and then suddenly it breaks through into a giant storm. So I mentioned before indeed that we don't see, that we never see many storms in the equator where the air is subsiding. Uh, at other regions where you see a lot of clouds, air is rising in the atmosphere. So in particular, actually in these regions where overall the air is subsiding, such convective storms might occur. And so we think that this storm on Neptune might be one of these really rare events. So using all the available data from large telescopes and amateur data uh, that permitted a, uh, an accurate drift speed of about 200 meters per second, uh, using just all cloud features also from the Voyager. Well, in particular from the Voyager, you get a wind profile which is, that is indicated by the black line on this uh, graph on the right. Using CAC data at K-band, which is 2.2 micron, uh, 
which probes high in, altitude high up in the atmosphere, even above the tropopause, uh, we see that the winds are pretty similar to what Voyager discovered. But when you look at 1.6 micron and probe deeper levels, you get a wind profile that is a little bit uh, less in wind speed, which in fact is opposite to what you would expect based upon theory. Uh, anyway, these um, dark spots I talked about earlier, they have wind speeds that are just a little bit less than what Voyager uh, had, to, had found. And this large storm system has a wind speed that is even less than what we see in these so-called H-band observations. And that tells us that this large storm might be anchored relatively deep in the atmosphere. Okay, going back to composition of these planets, uh, we need data at many different wavelengths. Uh, and as I will show you uh, later in the talk, the composition of the atmosphere that we find that we found is kind of indicated here on the left. Uh, we basically see that most of the heavy elements are enhanced considerably over the protosolar value. So if you use those, uh, those, that composition, you can determine what cloud, which clouds you would expect in the atmosphere. And if we move, uh, if we start at the bottom, uh, I mean, deep in the atmosphere, we find this, this water cloud or solution cloud, water, liquid water with some other elements dissolved into it. Above that, we find the NH4SH uh, uh, cloud, the ammonia hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide cloud, where one molecule of ammonia gas combines with one molecule of H2S gas uh, and forms a solid. So it will use up all the H2S or ammonia, whichever is uh, least abundant. And so whatever is left above the NH4SH cloud uh, is either H2S, which we see on Uranus and Neptune, or ammonia, which we see on Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, so above the NH4S H cloud, we find then on Uranus and Neptune an H2S ice cloud, and the top cloud is methane ice. Also shown on this busy graph is the temperature pressure profile here in black, the tropopause, the yellow bands. Uh, and then in the visible and the near infrared, we receive sunlight that is reflected off clouds, aerosols, and gases. And we probe altitudes basically around the tropopause down to the top of the upper cloud layer. So in the mid-infrared, we receive thermal emission from the atmosphere and we probe levels in the stratosphere from about a millibar down again to about the top of the cloud layers. And then at millimeter and centimeter wavelengths using ALMA and the VLA, we receive the planet thermal emission from below the cloud layers down to within about the NH4SH cloud layer. So by using data at all these wavelengths, we can determine the composition of Neptune's atmosphere, which is very different from that of Jupiter, Saturn, or the Sun. And since all these gases are condensable, we really need to probe below the cloud layers. Plus what we measure also depends on the circulation in the atmosphere. And that we can in turn derive sort of from the data. So the methane abundance has been determined uh, most recently using uh, data uh, from Hubble Space Telescope, uh, STIS uh, spectroscopy. Um, and from that, we can also see that there's a latitudinal variation on the disk from roughly about 2% up to 4% in abundance, 2% near the poles, 4% near the equator. Uh, so the Uranus data were obtained in 2002 and 2012, so we can actually have both hemispheres here. So this translates into an enhancement of the order of 50 to 80 above the protosolar value. So below these um, uh, graphs, we also show images in a methane absorbing filter and one in a hydrogen absorbing filter. So and in particular on Uranus, uh, you can clearly see that the equator is much darker in the methane absorbing filter, uh, meaning that 
there's much more methane near the equator. And that same is true on Neptune, but the contrast is harder to see on these particular images. So radio spectra of Jupiter and Saturn show that the composition is basically near solar. So that's kind of what you would expect. So ammonia gas is the main source of opacity. And in the middle, I show contribution functions uh, that show depending on wavelengths or frequency at uh, around a centimeter, you probe within the ammonia ice cloud on Jupiter. And if you go to longer wavelengths, uh, like um, 50 centimeter or so, you probe down to about um, 50 bars or so. So from, um, so only at these long wavelengths, we can probe uh, below the expected cloud layers. So from the Galileo probe and now also Juno, we know that ammonia is enhanced about three times above solar on Jupiter in the deep atmosphere. Uh, and by decreasing the ammonia abundance in the upper atmosphere, we can match its spectrum quite well, as shown here by the red curve. Uh, all the red data points, by the way, are from the VLA. Uh, so it's not entirely solar. I mean, a solar abundance planet is shown by the upper uh, black line, which is a little bit too warm. And the blue line shows an enhancement of about, uh, I think, um, five times globally uh, across the atmosphere. And then for Saturn, the same is true. A solar abundance atmosphere is a little too warm. And if you enhance everything by a factor of 10 above so, uh, protosolar, it's too cold. And so the red line shows kind of a nice uh, fit to the data. Um, so basically, I mean, the bottom line for this talk is that both Jupiter and Saturn are pretty close to solar. Also on Saturn, it looks like the ammonia abundance is enhanced by about three times over solar, whereas the H2S abundance is about 10 times above protosolar. And we'll get back to that later in the talk. So now moving to Uranus and Neptune, uh, we see that it's very different. So already in the 70s, uh, it was noticed that a solar composition atmosphere, as shown by the dashed line, is way too cold. And so that means that uh, there's just simply not much ammonia gas in the atmospheres of these two ice giants. In order to remove ammonia, assuming there is ammonia, that means that there must be a lot more hydrogen sulfide than ammonia. So you can actually lose the ammonia gas into this large NH4SH cloud, which is this purple one over here. So when you indeed combine all of that and also the fact that in these planets at the high pressures probed, even H2S, which is uh, absorption lines in the millimeter are pressure broadened so much that you actually do get some opacity at centimeter wavelengths. So if you put all that together, you'll find that H2S has to be enhanced about 40 times over the solar um, sulfur value, and that ammonia remains roughly solar, even, well, within below the NH4SH cloud layer. So also we have determined H2S here in sort of an indirect way. It has recently been detected directly in the very upper parts of the atmosphere via infrared spectroscopy uh, in the upper by, by Pat Irwin in England. So in addition to the spectra, we also use the spatial brightness distribution uh, of the planets, which is shown here in these ALMA and VLA maps. Uh, and both of these planets really show that the poles are much, much brighter than the equator or any other latitude on the planet. Uh, we also see some uh, brighter and darker latitudinal bands. But so we use these images in addition to, well, we use spectra on these different uh, regions 
on the planets to determine ultimately the composition that I just showed you. So the derived altitude profiles for uh, H2S then is shown in these plots here. And, and basically uh, we see that there is a lot of H2S in the equatorial reaches, mid latitudes in particular, and that there's a large depletion over the poles. So if H2S is depleted over the poles, it means there's less opacity. So we can probe deeper, warmer layers which explains why the poles of these planets are warm compared to other regions. So at the higher altitudes, uh, the H2S abundance either follows the saturated vapor curve, or usually there's a lower humidity above, uh, above the clouds. So let's go and, and see what the global circulation models look like. And for this, we also use mid-infrared data uh, where we probe the stratosphere down to about the tropopause. So at 20 micron, we are sensitive to hydrogen uh, absorption and we probe down to about the tropopause and around 10 micron, we are sensitive to various hydrocarbons and we probe the stratosphere. So again, as shown on these images, the pole is warm at all these wavelengths and in fact, at 20 micron, the equator is also warm on Uranus. So these data then were inverted uh, to give us a temperature uh, distribution. And the temperature distribution in the stratosphere, which is the main, uh, where, where the mid infrared is mainly sensitive to, shows that there are two uh, cold regions over the mid latitudes. Uh, so these regions are cold. Uh, as opposed in contrast to the warmer equator and the warm poles. And that is the same on both planets. So that means in order to get these cold regions above mid latitudes, that means that we uh, have gases rising up and adiabatically cooling the atmosphere. And then the dry air after things have condensed out will, uh, will condense, will descend back in the atmosphere over the equator and the poles, adiabatically heating the atmosphere. So using Voyager data, people have used, have uh, determined the uh, para hydrogen fraction uh, from the Voyager data. Uh, and that basically, well, the, the figure I show here shows the uh, deviation from thermal equilibrium uh, in the para hydrogen uh, air. So, so essentially, the blue regions show that we see a sub equilibrium uh, condition in para hydrogen, which means that air from deep down, where it was in equilibrium, is rising upward fast enough before it can equil equilibrate. Uh, and that is happening above the mid latitudes, the same latitude regions where we see the cold air in the stratosphere. So this hangs pretty well together. I mean, that you have rising gas at the mid latitudes and then sinking over the equator and the poles, where in fact in the para hydrogen we see super equilibrium, meaning that indeed we get colder air down from above. So now we can put all of this together, the radio and infrared, uh, visible and mid-infrared, to give us this uh, general circulation model uh, where the air is rising at mid-latitudes, it's condensing out. So you show, um, so you show cloud features uh, in the visible and the near-infrared, uh, and it cools in the mid-infrared. The dry air descends over the equator and the poles. So we don't see many clouds over the equator and the poles. We see warm air at, in the mid infrared. And because the air is dry, we can probe much deeper, warmer layers in the atmosphere at radio wavelengths. However, not everything, of course, agrees with this picture. Otherwise, it would be too simple. Uh, so VLA one centimeter maps show a brightening at uh, mid-southern latitudes on Neptune, uh, 
uh, and using ALMA and VLA data uh, show also a brightening on Uranus at mid latitudes. And so a brightening means it's warmer, so we must probe deeper layers in the atmosphere, which means it must be dry air descending down there rather than rising. So Karkoshka saw that methane gas is low at mid-southern latitudes between about one and three bar on both planets, which again shows subsidence rather than the rising air in the picture on the left. And then finally, there's uh, one of my grad students found a vertical gradient in the zonal wind profile, which I actually had shown you before in this picture with the red and blue kind of bands. Uh, and that vertical gradient in the zonal wind profile is opposite to what one would expect. That can be reconciled if the equator is colder than mid latitudes at levels over one bar, so deeper in the atmosphere than about the one bar level or the methane cloud level, or methane must be very strongly depleted at mid latitudes. So an alt alternative circulation pattern then is shown in this graph, where the top layer is essentially the same pattern I showed before, where you have rising gas at mid latitudes sinking down over the poles and the equator. Um, but Below that, we have a pattern that is in the opposite direction, except over the poles, where air is still descending all the way from the stratosphere milli, uh, millibar or so down to at least the NH4SH cloud layer. That is the depth we can probe at the radio wavelengths. So this kind of schematic at least solves some of the uh, things that did not fit the picture before. And so maybe this is what the general circulation is. However, I wonder what the Uranus orbiter and probe will find once they get there. So what are the implications of this composition on models of planetary formations? So again, to recap, we have found that uh, on Uranus and Neptune that the carbon must be enhanced about 50 to 80 times over solar, silver and oxygen about 40 times. Well, oxygen we don't know, silver about 40 times and oxygen maybe even a few hundred times. So we can compare these enrichments in Uranus and Neptune with those found on the other, uh, on the gas giants. So essentially on Jupiter, all the elements are, are enhanced by roughly the same factor, between about two and five, except for helium and neon, which are uh, kind of lost into the interior. On Saturn, uh, everything is essentially enhanced by a factor of 10. Of course, these noble gases have only been measured on Jupiter because that's the only planet where we have had a probe so far, and you cannot determine that from remote sensing techniques. So on Saturn, we saw that carbon and sulfur, and actually also phosphine, they're all enhanced by a factor of 10. Ammonia, maybe only by a factor of three. However, it is possible because in the radio on Saturn two, we only probe down to about the 10, 15 bar level, that just like the Galileo probe and Juno have found on Jupiter, that ammonia is enhanced at deeper levels and so that there is a lot of dynamics going on. So we don't know for sure if ammonia is indeed depleted compared to the other values or not. But then on Uranus and Neptune, we found a big depletion of ammonia compared to the other uh, uh, gases. So there are a bunch of models for planet formation. And essentially, all these models favor the so-called core accretion model, where uh, just uh, planetesimals get together, uh, fuse, and form the uh, original core of the, of the planets. And only after that, it is trapping gas, and, uh, and more planetesimals will fall in. So the homogeneous enhancement in all the elements on Jupiter 
agrees with Toby Owen's hypothesis that volatiles might have been adsorbed on amorphous ice at temperatures below about 30 Kelvin, that is at distances from the sun beyond the orbit of Pluto. So they suggested that perhaps Jupiter or at least the planetesimals forming this giant planet migrated inwards after formation at this large distance, or maybe the protoplanetary disk was just much colder than current models assume. So, but as I showed, the situation is very different for the other planets. So they must have formed from a different type of planetesimal. And in fact, that different type of planetesimal can also uh, explain Jupiter. So volatiles in the protoplanetary disk can be trapped in crystalline ices as class rate hydrates, or they can also condense out themselves if it is cold enough. So since we don't see subsolar abundances, we don't even discuss this here. So planetesimals, when they form at large distances, they are composed of this amorphous ice and volatiles may be absorbed onto these. So when they migrate inwards, they will cross this amorphous to crystalline transition zone, the ACTZ. And that is where water ice crystallizes, which is an exothermic reaction. So it releases heat and the adsorbed volatiles are released to the disk. Those volatiles can then be trapped as class rates into, that, into the water crystals. Um, and of course, when the disk gets cold enough, they could also condense into their own crystallized ice. So class rate formation needs about six water molecules for every trapped molecule. Uh, the relative abundances in planetesimals for two end models, so either having everything condensed into their own crystallized ice or clathrated, are shown on, uh, on the right in these colorful diagrams. Well, this picture will, of course, get much more complicated when you realize that this uh, amorphous to crystalline uh, transition zone is moving inwards when the disk cools and planetesimals or pebbles may vaporize when they cross the snow lines of pure condensates. Anyway, I think the picture itself is quite complicated, but maybe we can just get some ideas by looking at the relative abundances of these various um, uh, elements. So if the planets formed from this amorphous ice, then you expect an homogeneous enhancement in all elements. The noble gases, argon, krypton, xenon, and uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and, and, uh, and phosphor. If, uh, let's see. So if um, the planetesimals are formed through this class rate model, which is the orange curve or condensates, you can see that the relative abundances uh, of these various elements are very different. So we measure actually that carbon uh, to sulfur is larger than one and not less than one as shown actually on this uh, particular graph over here. And similar, it's about 40 as we measured uh, using these uh, radio observations. Um, actually, I, I misspoke here. So it's, it's expected to be one and a half to two and we measure 40. So using a probe, then just like on Jupiter, then we can measure the noble gases and in particular, we can look at the xenon to argon uh, abundance ratio, which will tell us whether it is, well, it definitely will tell us whether it's formed from amorphous ice or class rate or condensates, but even uh, the distinction between class rate and condensates can probably be made. We further, with a probe, can measure helium and neon, which will tell us a lot about the heat balance on these planets and interior processes and also is needed for planetary evolution models. So essentially we think that in order to 
get some handle on formation scenarios using a probe as NASA now has kind of uh, is envisioning with the Uranus orbiter and probe mission, uh, we can get a handle on some of these uh, some of these puzzles. Oxygen, however, would be hugely important because oxygen in these latter two models is expected to be much more enhanced than any of the other elements. However. To measure oxygen, you really have to go down to hundreds of bars of pressure. And that this probe is not feasible. Moreover, you have to get the signal out to find out what the probe is measuring. And also at, uh, in, at radio wavelengths, you, you have to go to incredibly long wavelengths and it, it's just not feasible. Now there is one other uh, way one can constrain oxygen or the water abundance, and that is through uh, CO observations uh, in uh, the upper atmosphere stratosphere. So basically, if you can constrain the CO abundance that is coming up from the interior of these planets, then what you observe is the equilibrium abundance at the quench level that is above which dynamical transport of carbon monoxide is much faster than equilibration at the deeper, warmer layers, because you would expect uh, that at the deep, warm layers, CO is kind of um, prominent, whereas at higher levels, it's methane gas. But if you can then bring up CO fast enough that it does not uh, transform into methane gas, you can using diffusion models and lots of assumptions, you can constrain ultimately the water abundance in the deep atmosphere, which right now is kind of agree, uh, kind of agrees with models that show enhancements of the order of 400 to 700 or so above solar abundance. However, the CO abundance boiling up from the deep interior from current measurements is also uh, agrees with basically zero. So we really only have sort of an upper bound constraint right now. But perhaps with the NGVLA, uh, we can get much uh, more precise measurements of CO uh, and get a better handle on this uh, in intriguing actually puzzle. And we can do the same with CO on Jupiter and Saturn, by the way. Okay, let's um, now talk a little bit about the long-term evolution because we learn a lot from long-term evolution of the planets. And that is shown here by Lockwood's plots. And they span about 70 years. He has observed both planets from about 1950 up to about 2020 when he really retired and, and, and stopped. Uh, so these are all done in B magnitude, which is near 450 micron. So the, the top graph shows, shows Uranus and the dashed line there shows what you would expect if Uranus is just a, uh, uh, a uniform planet and because it's slightly oblate and then the changing viewing angle would give rise to that dashed line. But as shown, I mean, it, there's a large deviation and already many decades ago, uh, people had suggested that there might be an albedo gradient from the equator to the North Pole uh, or to both poles as shown now in images uh, seen here at 1.6 micron. So for Neptune, we also see this intriguing kind of rise, I mean, variations. Neptune, we now have seen almost half a orbital period and for Uranus, almost a full orbital period. Um, so for Neptune, maybe what we see, again, this is reflected sunlight, might be tied in with changes in its cloud deck or cover. So for Uranus, we also have uh, 
measurements at radio wavelengths uh, from about 1965 or so onwards, uh, done by Mike Klein. And they show a very similar pattern as in the visible wavelength. So they also show a clear rise in the radio brightness distribution up to about 1980 uh, at uh, solstice, uh, and then a decline again. And at the time that was also interpreted as being caused perhaps by warmer poles. And that again was confirmed when maps could be produced. Okay, back to Neptune. So we have a long timeline of images uh, taken with the Keck telescope. And we see here that overall the cloud activity does seem to vary, uh, but that's really very much more pronounced during the past few years. So here, 2019, you slowly see that clouds are kind of disappearing. So it's very, very blank. It's just not much going on. Maybe it's picking up again a little bit lately. So if an uh, undergraduate student, well, she's now in between undergraduate and graduate school, uh, Irandi Chavez, and she has been looking at the long-term evolution of the cloud coverage on Neptune using both HST and CAC data. And here we see its overall reflectivity. So similar to what Lockwood showed on his plots. And we actually see an incredibly nice correlation with variations in the solar ultraviolet emissions. Uh, we do not see, I mean, basically all these measurements, 2005 or summer solstice over the, uh, in the Southern hemisphere, all these measurements were basically taken in the same kind of summer period. So you don't really see variations that you can attribute to seasonal variations. But so, variations tied in with solar UV are indeed possible because solar ultraviolet would affect clouds and aerosol through chemical reactions. So this is something that is still uh, in preparation to, in a paper by her. Well, temperature is another thing that may have and actually does show a long-term variation. Uh, so this one shows that Neptune's temperature as shown or measured at mid-infrared wavelengths, so really in the stratosphere, as indicated by that, that circle, uh, that that has been decreasing over time since 2003. And 2003 is before this summer solstice in 2005. So that's a little bit odd. And in addition, this South Pole, as shown on the images, appears to have become dramatically warmer in just the past few years. And that uh, taken together as a disk integrated or average profile shows that rather than the decrease we see from 2003 up to whenever uh, shows an increase, uh, which is really just caused by that South Pole. So this is, kind of very hard to interpret because it clearly does not uh, agree with seasonal variations. But we have to realize, first of all, we measure not directly the temperature in the stratosphere, but of course we measure the brightness temperature uh, and that is, uh, and, or the radiance to be more precise. And that is tied in both with the temperature of the atmosphere and the abundance of the species we measure, which in this particular case for these images is, is ethane. So there is a feedback mechanism here. We have photochemical and radiative processes. And somehow there is a balance between heating and cooling of the atmosphere. So methane gas will absorb sunlight, heats up the atmosphere, but methane gas in the stratosphere will also uh, dissociate and form ethane at the end. And ethane will emit at infrared wavelengths and therefore cool the atmosphere. But what we measure is also tied in with the abundance of ethane, which will increase. So you have two competing things to finally give us the, the radiance of that, uh, of that planet. So 
clearly there's no good explanation for this data yet. And as observers would say, uh, you need more data and maybe more models. Anyway, with that, I'd like to just summarize and talk a little bit about future prospects. So we have uh, looked at the composition of the atmosphere, which gives us at least some information on the place and history of formation. So we really need the abundances of water, helium, helium, neon, the, the noble gases. And water is really hard to constrain. And I hope that indeed with the NGVLA that can be done, it cannot be done with uh, the Uranus orbiter and probe, unless maybe they have a very sensitive um, uh, spectrometer to measure CO. Uh, the spatial variations in the condensable species give us the global circulation. Uh, we have seen some of these very large convective storms. We have no idea how they're triggered, nor how often they appear. We've talked not much, but a little bit about these dark spots, which also on, on well, actually they are on both planets, but we talked about Neptune in particular. We don't really know the origin or the makeup or the frequency also, uh, there are some clues that maybe they're caused by a thinning uh, of the uh, hydrogen sulfide cloud, uh, uh, hydrogen sulfide ice cloud below the methane cloud. We talked about the long-term brightness variations, and in, this, in, in the beginning, we talked a little bit about rings and moons. So hopefully, in the future, with JWST, NGVLA, SCA, and then, of course, ultimately the Uranus orbiter probe. We hope we get some clues about the formation of these planets. Thank you. Thank you very much, Umke. Uh, I see we are just about at the end of the hour, but I think we still have, we can still take some questions. Uh, if anyone has questions, please raise a hand. Uh, I had an obvious parochial one. What can we can we do something useful with Meerkat in the meantime? Uh, I well, I haven't really looked much into the <laughs> what we can do with Meerkat, but um, I mean the images that you showed of Jupiter are quite incredible. So I think if we can observe, make observations, any observations with Meerkat of these planets, that might be a really useful tool. So we should look into that. So I guess our sweet spot for Meerkat is the fact that we have such high instantaneous sensitivity. So basically, if there is any short-term variation that can be usefully observed, I think Meerkat is probably the ultimate instrument for that. Yeah, but so you, uh, I mean, it's around 20 centimeter or so, um, which, which really probe much deeper, I mean, probe deeper layers in these atmospheres. And if, I mean, we've done this, uh, I don't think we've done this recently with the VLA, with the upgraded VLA, but I know uh, many years ago we had to integrate long, long times with the VLA, and even then we got, we got pretty noisy measurements. So, um, so it would be helpful to constrain indeed composition deeper in the atmosphere, so we'll never get below the water clouds. Okay, do we have any more questions from the audience? I also had another, maybe, well, maybe it's a simple question, but uh, at the beginning when you were showing, I think it was the, the rings of Uranus edge on, and you said when yeah. the rings are edge on, that's when you detect an outer ring, which you don't detect otherwise. Why is that? Is yeah. it just a dynamic image thing from the... So, so, uh, so when they're edge on, you basically get, it's a reflected light that we measure here. Uh, so you basically sort of get um, uh, a combination of all the reflected light uh, from along the line of sight of that entire ring. And if it's open, then uh, it's just optically thin. You, you just don't see anything. Uh, okay, right. Uh, so I, by the way, I mean, I didn't show that, but we have seen Uranus rings also in ALMA data, uh, so at three millimeter wavelengths and one, one millimeter wavelengths. Uh, and 
if you combine kind of the ALMA data, and my, my student has done that in a paper, with at the same time they had, or around the same time they had discovered the rings also at, uh, I think it was 20 micron data. And by combining that, which is at the both sides of the Planck radiation uh, black body curve, you can determine the temperature of those ring particles. And, um, and that gives you some information about, well, in this case, in this particular case, it was uh, shown that um, the particles are kind of not rotating fast, but more, uh, uh, more rotating synchronously with, with their orbit. I should have added that into the talk that I, I had already so much. <laughs> But it's, it was very neat. We had not expected to steer rings around Uranus in, in the radio data. So that was a, a very neat little discovery. All right, very cool. All right, time for one last quick question, perhaps, if anyone has a question. If not, then let's thank the speaker again. Uh, thank you very much, Imke. Thank you. Great, and uh, it was yeah, it was very nice to yeah to indeed listen to something that's not just radio. <laughs> right, and and very and, different. Uh, so uh, and, and a little bit yeah. closer closer to home, right? Yeah, the right, close to home, but also it spans many different wavelengths, and um, I try to make things clear, but who knows. <laughs> um, All right, great. Well, thanks a lot again. And yeah. hope to see you at future one. Bye bye. Yeah, bye bye.